Please welcome panel moderator, executive managing director, GE Ventures, Karen Carr. Thus far, we've explored how additive is transforming aviation, aerospace, and healthcare. Now we'd like to look at how additive is transforming retail and really helping to enable new business models. And a wonderful example of that is the partnership between Adidas and Carbon. Uh, last year, they announced the Futurecraft 4D uh, athletic shoe, which has a 3D printed midsole. Um, the shoe, and actually all of us are wearing them, and I'm so, so super bummed that you guys can't see them because the shoe is both beautiful and comfortable, and uh, many of you ladies know that's a tough thing to achieve. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I'm pleased to be joined here today by James Carnes. He's the Vice President of Global Brand Strategy at Adidas. Um, he leads their open source collaboration, and previously he was the SVP of design and global creative di director performance. Um, and he's also trained as a industri in industrial design. I'm also pleased to be joined by Joe DeSimone, who's the founder and CEO of Carbon. Joe's trained in chemistry. Uh, he's uh, so probably the only. Uh, yeah, well, he's probably one of the only folks I know who holds not one but two named professorships uh, in uh, chemistry and chemical engineering at UNC and uh, NC State, and one of a very select group of people who is a member of all three national academies. So Joe, thanks for coming, and James as well, and uh, I should disclose that GE Ventures is an investor in carbon. James, our audience here is largely industrial. Help us to understand why uh, a retail brand like Adidas cares about additive manufacturing. I mean, there, there's really two reasons. One is we get an amazing product, right? So, so the way that we use um, Carbon's printing technology is to create a midsole. And for us, it's the, it's the highest performance that we can achieve. So for us, from a consuming, consumer facing standpoint, we're getting the, the highest quality product. I think uh, what that leads to starts to become even more exciting, right? Because we have all sorts of innovations and technologies launched every six months. But for us, the, the eventual move from you know, software enabled prototyping and production to truly digitally connected production opens up all sorts of opportunities with new business models, right? Today, we basically, we're on a schedule where we're creating new product every six months, but we have to do that at least 15 to 18 months out on a futures order. All of that product, 400 million pairs of, of shoes are created in advance every year, put in a warehouse, we put marketing money behind it, and we really try to drive and push that product, hoping it all sells. The eventual opportunity here is, is to create the product once it's been purchased. So this idea of an on-demand production model is really enticing. And then you get into all the other opportunities with customization and so on. So it's not just one thing. It opens up a whole new door uh, to, to, to new technology, to new production, yeah. and, and all sorts of things. Joe, tell us a little bit about how this partnership came about with Adidas. So we certainly knew that um, running shoes was going to be a killer app. There was a lot of talk about it for a long time along with the dental space, you know, two, and for polymer-based 3D printing, those were the two going into this that we saw. But we also knew that it was held back by not having uh, a technology that would scale at, with the right speed, the right economics, and then, most importantly, not having a material through traditional 3D printing, didn't have a material that would have the properties to have the energy recovery and the resiliency required uh, for this. So, as we began looking at the <clears throat> marketplace and the key players, you know, what it, how Adidas stood out for us was firstly, it was, a, it was a technical organization that was entrenched in design and manufacturability. And you know, there's a lot of companies out there that have these kinds of dimen <clears throat> dimensions, but they're separated. Adidas is, is an integrated uh, team that works well with one another. Mm -hmm. And in addition, they, had a, they did not suffer from a not invented here 
uh, attitude. They, you know, they have calling all creators, they're an open engagement model. And so those two things really resonated with our company for a, a, close, a close, tight knit relationship. Okay, sounds like a great partnership. James, you've got a, a, a background in design. How has Additive changed the whole design paradigm and process? I mean, it, it, in two ways. One of them is really enabling, right? The possibility that you can create uh, all sorts of new structural components, test them out beyond just prototyping, but then go straight into production. That, that's one angle. It's sort of the, uh, somebody was saying earlier, Star Trek, or, you know, we used to talk about the Jetsons. You know, you can imagine something and you don't have to worry about undercuts and all sorts of slider molds and things like that. You can just print it. And I think the other way for, for designers as well is um, the direct connection to, to athletes, right? So we were talking about, you know, how does an athlete actually benefit from this beyond just one singular great product, which is where we're at today. So, you know, one example that I was talking about, if you take three of our best football players, so you've got Vaughn Miller, who's on the big end of it. You've got uh, uh, Aaron Rodgers, who's one inch shorter, 15 pounds lighter, and then you've got DeAndre Hopkins, who's another inch shorter, another 15 pounds lighter. Not only the differences between how each of those guys is built, but also how they play with different positions. Right now, if we want to customize a product for them, it's a one-off. And all of the data that we collect to assess them and build that product basically goes into that one product, and it's over. Going forward, the assessment that we actually get out of each of those athletes' performance profile goes into ongoing iterations of product, and we can make that product available to somebody who's a similar profile, whether they're in college or professional or uh, high school football. So it starts to really change the way that we, we design iteratively going forward, and not just creating one-offs or mass production mutually exclusive from each other. Thanks. Um, Joe, you talk about the, uh, the tyranny of injection molding, yeah. uh, and that has to impact uh, how we think about design and how we think about um, iterating products. Right. So when you think about all these different <clears throat> product teams, whether it's running shoes or a medical device or automotive, I mean, take uh, autonomy in cars, self-driving cars. When you go from level one autonomy to level four autonomy, there is an 8x increase in the number of sensors required. You go from two miles a wire to 12 miles a wire. Everything needs connectors, brackets. Every one of those steps is gated by having an ejection molding tool to iterate on, to design it. Same thing happens in medical devices. <clears throat> you can make the argument that injection molding is a drag on the economy, slowing down product introductions. The ability of designing final products and designing products on the means of production that can scale in quality and cost allows these teams to go much, much faster. And then you can start now really taking advantage of collapsing designs from you know, six parts to one part, doing things you couldn't make by traditional and move much faster. And so, you know, we really, we think the tyranny of injection molding is one of the places where a, a digital fabrication technique is gonna have a profound implication, let alone disrupting the supply chain and on-demand, local for local. Those are additive on top of that. Super. <clears throat> James, Adidas just opened its second speed factory in Atlanta, which is exciting. It's the first outside of, uh, outside of Germany. Can you tell us a little bit about what the speed factory is and what you guys are trying to achieve with it? Yeah, I mean, and how it, additive is a part of that? Exactly, too. I was yeah. going to say it, it. It lines up perfectly with what we're doing with Carbon and, and the team there. That 80% um, of our production right now is, is in Asia, right? For all of the reasons Joe described, it's where we can do injection molding, less expensive, ramp up high volumes. But it also takes us that time. What we've done with those two facilities in, in Atlanta and in Ansbach, Germany, is to, to create sort of a prototype pilot facility that allows us to kind of reclaim the ability to, to define our own supply chain from raw material side all the way to consumer facing production. And it's, it's a place for us to first prototype and then put those technologies into production. And um, carbon is basically the first of you know, three or four of these that we're trying that are either additive or automated or robotic. Um, it currently isn't the scale that we need to do high production like we do in our, in our current facilities, but uh, it allows us to basically shape our own destiny, and, and working with, with Joe and the team has allowed us to basically prove that through one of the first technologies we put in there with, with carbon. 
So I'm a runner, okay, and I enjoyed my run this morning on the Hudson. It was, it was fantastic. And I run with, a, uh, with an orthotic. When are you guys going to be able to take all of my measurements and print out a shoe for me in Atlanta and get it to me in Chicago? When's that going to happen? That's, that's what everyone's asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that is, I mean, that's the goal. Um, I think what, what we've actually found now is while in the, in, the, in the past we thought that the problem was creating the individual product, basically Joe's team has solved that. Now the, the issue is individual assessment, right? Where we are today to get the high de uh, definition assessment from each of you to create your own shoe, we have to invite you into a facility, put you on a force play to make sure that you're getting the exact profile that matches left and right, right? Have bad news for you biomechanically, no one's symmetrical. Right? Everybody's got a, a longer leg or a different stride left to right. So the next step is actually for us to work with Joe's team to develop um, portable technology. So what we're working on now is being able to actually profile somebody's specific biomechanical needs from their phone. So just boiling it down to, to matching up how you move over a 20 minute run using an accelerometer to what we know about the, the biomechanical tendencies. Um, to be able to get an orthotic or a completely customized midsole. I mean, that's, that's only a couple of years away in our, in our planning. A couple of years away? You do, do you agree it's a couple of years away? Or what's holding us back from this mass customization, economies of one? Yeah. <clears throat> well, in, in dental, we already do this, right? I mean, a great example. It's an N of one. Everyone, you know, digital dentistry is just taking off. And so the opportunity now, <clears throat> in a similar way, is all about data, data acquisition, tracking through the factory, individual products, getting them back to Chicago, where the data may be acquired. And so it's about business models, <clears throat> it's about data, it's about taking advantage of cloud-based computing, finite element analysis, uh, conformal lattices, digital simulations, digital twin of the printing process, <clears throat> so that once you do all that, when you print it, it's exactly what's expected. Okay. so. Uh I just got back from Hanover Mesa, which is a big uh, manufacturing uh, trade show. And uh, during one of the talks, um, uh, John Backus, who's a VP at Oracle, gave you guys a shout out at Carbon and said you guys are one of the few companies who actually has a, re a digital business model. Now, your printers are connected to the cloud. What does that do for you, and how, do, how does that help to improve the state of the art in additive. Yeah. So when Alan Mullally, one of our board members, was at Boeing, he ran the commercial Boeing uh, uh, system, uh, he wanted his supplier, GE, to move into a power by the hour. Uh, he wanted the most fuel efficient jet engines. He wanted to build airplanes. And in the same sort of partnership that Boeing and GE has, have appreciated, we do that same thing with our customers. So our printer is available via subscription model. <clears throat> We pushed software every six weeks over the air. Our founding VP of engineering was the founding VP of engineering at Tesla. The Tesla car is the only car that gets over the air software upgrades. And so our printer is accreting in value. It's a digital printing process. <clears throat> we just introduced two new resins yesterday. Everybody around the world saw two new resins show up on their user interface. The software has already been written. They can now start printing <clears throat> their products in these new resins. So that ability to future-proof a customer, this printer is never going to be obsolete. You don't, you, it's not, a, it's not going to be a, a, a paperweight. Uh, it's a subscription. So when you're on in an innovation curve that we are on, the last thing you want to do is for the customer to be worried about, well, should I wait till the technology advances? You can get on this wave now and not worry about uh, being, uh, uh, being future-proofed uh, from obsolescence. And so that's a key part of the of the approach. Okay, cool. So I'm curious, where do you guys see all of this going? What's next, right? Where's additive going with you? What are you excited about in the future? I mean, I talked about all the, the, the business model implications, digitizing our entire supply chain. So I think, you know, beyond that, I think one of the things that, that we share that we're excited about together is um, this idea that you're already saving waste. In, in the production process, right? If you're waiting to produce once a, an order has been placed, uh, we as a company really have a high value uh, as one of our five board level KPIs around sustainability. 
Um, and we're, we're evaluating, you know, we, we're a plastics company. We make plastic stuff and most of it doesn't get recycled. It doesn't go back into any, any sort of supply chain. So the idea that we can now focus with Joe's team on the polymer science around different options for recyclability, um, around biofabrication, and start to create entire products that can be part of a circular economy using one of the most advanced additive manufacturing capabilities known is really exciting because it's not either or, right? In a lot of people's frame of mind, you know, technology and, and advanced production doesn't go hand in hand with sustainability. And with these guys, we're actually able to do the two together. So that's something that's very dear to us that we're excited about. Yeah, yeah uh, digital sustainability is really a focus for carbon. When we think about the, the resin, we're scaling up the Target 2 resin with Adidas. 50 uh, weight percent of that will be a bio-based feedstock derived from corn. And the version after that will be recyclable uh, systems. It's really important to Adidas. It's important to us. It's important to our whole company. This is a new future happening in, in plastics and polymers and adhesives, elastomers. And we've got a huge responsibility to make sure um, that we, as we create this new future, that we're doing it in a sustainable way. So it starts with the materials, recyclability, bio-based, and the like. It starts it also with dematerialization. We did a big partnership with Vitamix a component on a blender or a cleaner for blenders. It used to be six parts. It would break in the field, have to be thrown away. We redesigned it. It went from six part to one part. It's more durable. It weighs a third less mass. It's a third cheaper. And so you have the sustainability of these kinds of advanced designs making better products. And then it goes all the way to the fact that in automotive and transportation, you know, they have to have spare parts for decades. We had a group that wanted 10,000 Toyota Corolla parts for 1980, Toyota Corollas. <clears throat> These parts are sitting in air-conditioned warehouses for decades. And you think about the implications on the economy for storage, let alone the capital tied up in, those, in the spare parts inventory. So digital sustainability goes all the way from the materials to dematerialization to disrupting supply chains and freeing up capital and that's a, that's a key sort of central theme through everything we're doing. Okay. So I was on a tour um, of one of your competitors in Portland, and they're also interested. I mean, well, I guess all the shoe companies are in Portland anyway, right? So I, mean, I learned that last they're all night. There. All of them are in Portland. So, uh, And they also talked about this, the, the need to have, <coughs> wanting to do sustainability and the challenge of doing that when you have these um, mixed material systems. Um, so can we get to a point where, because of a fine control of geometries, we're able to um, have the shoe, the entire shoe printed uh, out of a, a single material where, you, where your, your sole has one property because of the geometry, the midsole a different because of the geometry and the uppers? or? What do you think, Joe? You're, you're the no, chemist so, here. So I think geometry takes you into a lot of places you couldn't go before. Yeah. And the midsole's got properties that are very different in different regions. And that's enabled by having geometry play a huge role. You know, we think about lateral stability mm -hmm. in running shoes, having stiffness in different parts of the shoe to give you the lateral stability, or depending if you're running or, you know, so we can do that today. <clears throat> the opportunity for taking that midsole and recycling it into fibers, being able to knit an upper, you know, those, kind, those things are going to happen. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think you actually want both geometry and materials to contribute to yeah. different function, and that'll be the, the approach. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. What, what's beyond shoes for 3D printing, as you, you just, think? You just talked about half of it. Um, apparel, so garments that are 3D printed. Uh, I mean, again, before <laughs> this, 3D printing for us was a prototyping technique, and now it's a production technique. So the possibility of being able to, to combine geometry and materials and develop both in, in different directions, either through, through creativity and imagination of the human brain or through algorithmic computational design, we start to get into really interesting things. And one of the things I was, I was observing downstairs talking to Joe was that, you know, we looked at the, the opportunity with replacing what was traditionally foam with a polymer. And that changed our entire view on the product. Again, thinking like you said, now what can we do with the, with the upper, with what we would traditionally use fabric for? And I was wondering the same thing about you know, uh, metal printing. You know, most of the things I've, I've seen, and I'm by no means an expert, so you guys can, 
can criticize me later, but I started wondering, how do you use metal printing for creating things that are not t traditionally metal parts? Can you, do up, can you do fabrics? Can you do garments? Can you do things completely outside of I've it? I've definitely seen some 3D printed dresses. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it, it, and that's because to get them all in the, the one direction, box and, yeah. and open that's, it up. That's where yeah. we want to go with that, because I think there's no end to it. And it just matches all the things. Yeah, that'd be a great tool to give Stella. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's a great well, idea. Actually, we'll talk about it. It'll be expensive. <laughs> I'm sure. In any event, I think uh, we have reached the end of our time here, but uh, enjoyed uh, both of you. Thanks, James. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for and, having me. Uh, and run out and buy a pair. They're awesome. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.